Welcome to this video in which I would like to present a scenario analysis on the question what is required to reach the climate goals. Well, who am I? I am Andreas Fennig and I am chemical engineer at the University of Liège in the group Products, Environment and Processes and we are frequently using balances to design chemical engineering processes. And one can of course apply identical balances or more or less identical balances to global processes, those global processes that are created by humans. And exactly because of that I would like to apply these balances to see how we can reach the climate goals. Well, what is the starting point? The starting point is actually the UN climate conference that took place at the end of 2015 in Paris in which an agreement was achieved and I would like to read this article 2.1. This agreement aims to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change by holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below 2 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial level and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels, recognizing that this would significantly reduce the risks and impacts of climate change. So many nations have agreed in principle that the climate goal of plus 2 degrees centigrade or even plus 1.5 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level is a very important goal that we should try to reach. So we should definitely reach the plus 2 degrees and we should even try to reach the 1.5 degrees. But what does that mean? What does it mean for us? Yeah, what are the consequences for us? Well, first of all, let's have a look at the major driver where everybody believes more or less and more or less is agreed that um, this is actually the cause, the major cause or one of the major causes for the climate change. It's a CO2 in the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's specified here the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere in parts per million, so one part in one million parts is carbon dioxide, as a function of time. And we see on the one hand side in blue the data from Hawaii. They are recorded on a very frequent uh, basis. And these are now the annual averages, so fluctuations average out a little bit. And I also included an orange line that is a straight line through the last years, the th last decades actually, of these values. And if you now look at what happened in the world, so to speak, with respect to climate change, and the limits of growth, you see that some of the major studies have been performed during the, exactly those last decades. From the Club of Rome, you have the study The Limits of Growth, the Global 2000 report, uh, then the Brundtland report, Our Common Future, the Kyoto Protocol, and then um, in 2015, the climate conference in Paris with its agreement. And you see that even though there have been quite significant insights generated actually little changes. There was a change somewhere around here around 1980 something whatever that came from but in the last years at least you don't see any significant change that is even though people know since meanwhile 30 plus years that there is something to uh, happen something possibly detrimental for us may happen hardly anything changes. So we continue to go on this straight line. And you see now on the other hand side, if we would follow that line, if you would still increase the CO2 production, increase the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere correspondingly, what would happen? We would in the end wind up with plus 1.5 and even plus 2 degrees centigrade by the year, but a little after 2040. So you see there is some actually very urgent need to change. 2040 is well in the perspective of our individual lifetimes. Yeah, you will, me, I will live until then, hopefully. And so we have to do something very significant by then. Possibly not finished by then, but we should get very well started by then. So it's very soon that we have to do something. That's the first thing we can realize. If we don't get significant action before that, so within the next very few years and few decades, uh, we run into the problem that we have easily plus 2 degrees centigrade of climate change. Now, in order to get some idea about the more specific consequences of that and what we need to do, 
I set up uh, balances, as I said, and I tried to do a scenario analysis. Scenario analysis is more or less looking, trying to look into the future, not necessarily really predicting what is going on in the future, what is going to happen in the future, because that depends on individual choices of politicians, of what is the outcome of certain elections, things like that play an important role, and of course one cannot predict that. So what one can do is one can take the data and try to extrapolate them with some sensible assumptions. And that's exactly what I have done. And then you can vary the assumptions and say, can see what is the common point behind various of these calculations, these simulations, and then see what is actually the trend. What are the major parameters that influence everything and what is the outcome? And so one can get an, an insight into the major drivers, the driving forces, and the major things that are going to happen if I play with these major parameters. And that's actually what I want to deliver in this presentation. The databases is shown on this slide. These are commonly uh, publicly available data from the FAUSTAT. It's from the United Nations, BP Global Energy Statistics, but there are others around and they are quite similar. The UN World Population Prospect will learn something about the population growth in the future, the CO2 data from Hawaii, then the Carbon Dioxide Information Anal Analysis Center that also has some CO2 data available. Taking these data and beyond that only some conversion factors and very simple uh, data, um, like the mass of the atmosphere or something like that, you are able to really set up a balance for the different things that are going to happen. How much fossil resources we are digging up, we are burning, and that is then released into the atmosphere, more or less. There's a factor behind it because the CO2 also winds up in the oceans. One can all calculate those things and with that build up the corresponding balances and see how the climate will change in the future. Now, in order to get a first idea of what we need to regard, let me plot the main parameters, the main variables that are relevant. First of all, there's the world population. It's us. Around now, some 7 billion people on this world, plus minus, and we are using certain things. It's energy, it's materials, and it's food. That are three of the major things. There are others, but like water, for example, but these are three main parameters that we need to regard. Energy, we are using on the average, on the global average, and in this presentation I'm always talking about global averages, 21,000 kilowatt hours per capita and year. Of the materials we are using, little less than one kilogram per capita and day. Plastics, things like that, pharmaceuticals, detergents, all that added up, adds up to roughly 0.9 kilograms per capita and day. And food, we produce 2.8 kilograms per capita and day. That doesn't mean that you eat that much because there are some processing losses in between. You produce feed that you then feed to the animals that gets reduced in the amount because of that inefficiency, so to speak. So our first primary production is 2.8 kilograms per capita and day, and from that we produce our food that is more or less sufficient for us currently now. For producing these three, three things, we have two sources, major sources, at least sources we want to regard. On one hand side, we have the fossil resources where we need currently, where we use 5.6 kilograms per capita and day. So everybody of us, more than five kilograms every day on global average, of course, uh, in uh, developed countries, industrial nations, it's more. In less developed countries, it's less, apparently. And we are also using land area, and here I account only for the agricultural area, that's 7,000 square meters per capita. Of course, there are deserts, there are permafrost regions and other things that are not accounted for. And so we are using 7,000 square meters, everybody of us, on the average. How much is that? Well. My backyard is not that big, uh, but a good idea to, to get a good idea of these 7,000 square meters is roughly uh, the size of an international soccer field. So everybody of us is more or less using a soccer field for agricultural purposes. So these are the two things that we're using currently. And actually, if you want to reduce the CO2 emissions, then we have to get rid of these fossil resources because they wind up in the end finally in the atmosphere of CO2, so we have to cross that out and produce everything from the land area. Well, actually not only the agricultural land area, because 
Uh, solar energy can of course also be produced in deserts, which is not accounted for here, which is also another fraction, so to speak. But nevertheless, it's the land area that we need to use for production of energy in the end. And everything now for the, all the materials have to come from the land area, well, and the food is coming from the land area mostly anyway. So now we see the major variables that are relevant, and so we can go through them, so to speak, step by step. The first parameter is the or variable is the world population. What can we say about the world population? If you look at the United Nations statistics, you find data that are plotted here in this diagram. You see the past, you see the future. We are here on this uh, vertical line today, more or less. Um, that's where the statistic ends, so to speak. And uh, in the United Nations World Population Prospect, they publish three possible scenarios for the future. A high variant, a medium variant, and a low variant. And actually, it is not specified which of these three variants is the most probable case. So we don't know which of these is likely or unlikely to happen. They explicitly don't uh, weight that somehow. So we are left with these three variants and you see that actually by the year even 2050 there is a significant difference and by the year 2100 there is a more than a factor two difference between the highest and the lowest variants. So we would like to get some idea how probable the different scenarios possibly are. Well, I'm an engineer and so what I did actually, I asked myself how did the UN people predict the world population for a given year, and I'd have chosen 2050, in previous predictions. So they repeat that calculation more or less and they publish that every two years. And I wanted to know, well, how did that prediction develop over time? So I ask, what does the United Nations predict for the year 2050 in different years of prediction? And that's actually shown here. So now the time is not the the time for, for which the population is predicted, but at which the population has been predicted for the year 2050. So in 2000 they predicted these three values, that we should have those th three values with the three variants in the year 2000, uh, in the year 2050. In the year 2002 they predicted these two values and so on. And if you look at these data, you see that there is a trend in the data. And that is actually sort of surprising. Uh, you see quite strong trends in the green and the uh, blue lines, in the low and the medium variant. Very little trend actually for the high variant. And that's sort of disturbing. And so what I did as a good engineer, I plotted or I fitted lines through that. I assumed straight lines, you can do differently if you like, but there has to be one uh, aspect that has to be regarded if you do that. And that is if you are in the year 2050 and you want to predict the world population for 2050, so for the year in which you actually are, then you can only count. And so you know the world population exactly. That means there is no difference anymore possible between the high variant and the low variant and the medium variant. They all have to give the same value, namely the value that is really happened, that is really realized that happened in 2050. And so the three extrapolations have to meet in one common point in the year 2050. So if I predict in the year 2050, for the year 2050, I'd only have to count to get a single number. So these three lines have to meet in that point. That was the only common point. I have three slopes and this common point that I can to fit, uh, that I can fit. So four parameters, I fitted them, and this is the outcome. And what you see is that you here wind up, if you do that, with a value of the order of 10.5 billion people. Now, how does that relate? For the year 2050, 10.5 billion people. We can plot that now into the previous slide where we see that these 10.5 billion people in the year 2050 is very close to the high variant. Which means not necessarily that that will be realized because again it's a scenario, it depends on very many things actually. You have political decisions mostly, also individual decisions. So we don't know which scenario will be the outcome in the end. But this number tells us that it is not unprobable that we actually will live with a high variant. So there is a quite significant probability that this will be realized and that we will follow more or less the high variant. 
And that's actually why I have chosen the high variant uh, in the following considerations as the base case. I've also did, I also did some calculations for the other variants and I compared that. But my base case is that of the high variant because I believe that that is quite a significant probability that that actually will occur. Now the second thing that we saw before on the major variables was the energy. Now let's, let's look at the energy as a next step. This is now the primary energy consumption, again in kilowatt hours per capita and year, as a function of time. And we see which energy sources have been used. Crude oil, natural gas, coal, nuclear and some renewable energies. And well, what we see is most of that is fossil resources and actually we set out with the last climate goals in, from the uh, last year UN conference to replace that by renewables. We see on the average we have indeed of the order of uh, 21,000 kilowatt hours per capita and uh, year. We also see that the overall uh, per capita consumption of primary energy is increasing over time. Reason for that is of course that on the global average people are developing. Nations are developing and because of that that requires, of course, more energy. Because of that, the per capita energy consumption will increase as well. And now the question is, well, if you want to look into the future, how can we de deal with that? How can we get some realistic estimate? I have used this trend. This is a fit to, to these data to a certain extent. And I extrapolated that into the future. Uh, actually, for the year 2100, it, it extrapolates to something of the order of 30,000 kilowatt hours per capita and year, which is significantly higher than that, but less than uh, industrialized nations are using today. In industrialized nations in Europe or North America, we have values of the order between 40,000 kilowatt hours to 50,000 kilowatt hours per capita and year. And I say, well, industrialized nations will learn how to save energy, so they will continually lose use less per capita, whereas the developing nations, they will continue to use more per capita energy consumption per year. So they will meet somewhere in the middle and I think it's a realistic assumption to say, well, that continues to a certain extent and it will level off around 2100 with a little less than uh, 30,000 kilowatt hours per capita and year. That, if you change that extrapolation a little bit, it changes a little bit the trends, but not the major uh, parameters, not the ma major output of the simulation. So you can uh, analyze that, of course, in the context of the scenario analysis. And that gives you the impression that the scenario that I predict is actually quite reliable. Something else I want to point out is that the, well, the hydropower has a pretty large fraction, but all the other renewables, they are only a very, very small fraction. They have been increasing during the last, say, 10 or 20 years, but it's a very small amount. Hydroenergy has, of course, its limits. It's accounted for also in this scenario analysis. So it's assumed that that will increase continually at some low uh, growth rate up to a certain limit, which was assumed to be a realistic limit to the overall possibly available hydropower that could be utilized. Well, now, in order to look a little bit more closely at these small contributions here, we could or we need to plot that differently. And I plotted that on a logarithmic scale. So logarithmic scale means that for the same uh, distance on the axis, I always have a factor of 10 here. And that allows me to plot the large contributions like crude oil, coal and natural gas on the same scale and really resolve that quite in, with some detail for solar energy, biofuels, wind and well other and the hydropower is somewhere over here. Well, some, something that, that some people may regard as being nice, I also regard that as nice that nuclear power is actually decreasing during the last years. That's a quite positive trend but will be maybe reversed of course also because of political issues. But the main point actually is that we see that the solar energy, the wind energy and also the biofuels have been increasing during past years. And they actually have been increasing quite steeply. Yeah, there's a very strong increase and if you evaluate that, there's the slope here, you see that the slope for individual years is up to 30 percent. 
But on the other hand, on the other hand side, you see in one time span this is increasing a little bit more than this is increasing this is increasing at the different time uh, level so to speak so what one would need to do actually one would sum these three values wind biofuels and solar and see how they overall have been increasing through the last years if i plot that i can see it here we see on the one hand side now the hydro energy and the solar wind and biofuels and we plot or i plotted the annual growth rate per year versus time and we see that actually for solar wind and biofuels that has been increasing over the last years somewhere on the level of 20 percent per year which is quite significant it decreased a little bit during the last years but let's assume that it can be 20 percent on the other hand side the hydro energy for last decades or actually also before here has been decreasing on the average of something of the order of 2.5 percent and as I said in my scenario analysis, I assume that that will continue for the next decades. Now, of course, this quite strong increase means that we can possibly continue further with that. And the first thing I would like to show is what happens if we assume that the solar, wind and biofuels will increase at that rate into the future. If we plot that, we get this result. So 20% annual increase of wind, solar, and biofuels. And we see that actually that we can get rid of the fossil resources well before the year 2040. That looks too good to be true. We actually achieve to be significantly below 1.5 degrees centigrade in our climate change and the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere uh, is kept quite in a limited case. Well, but let's have a closer look. Let's have a second look. Let's plot that again on a logarithmic scale. If we do that, we get this diagram. We see that the fossils are being well replaced by the renewables before the year 2040 completely. And if we now look at this annual increase of the 20% per year for solar, wind and biofuels, we see actually that that continues until the very end. And the question is, is that realistic? And of course it is not, because that means in the last year of that replacement, we are replacing more or less 20% of the fossil resources of our fossil power plants, of our fossil driven motors, everything. 20% of that we are replacing by re renewable power plants and um, motors that are driving with renewable energies. And of course that is unrealistic. The economy would not be able to, uh, to, to, to uh, well, allow that significant change. It would not be able to cope with that demand, so to speak, to replace 20% of our fossil power plants within one year. That's not feasible. So there has to be some limit. So while this increase has been 20% during the last years, more or less, that may continue for some years, but there has to be some limit what the economy can take, so to speak. And the question is, what is that limit? Because that limit in the end determines how fast we can proceed with the replacement of fossil energy by renewable energy. Well, and of course, we can now ask ourselves, how fast can that growth be? How fast can that limit be in the end? What is a realistic estimate of what is possible? On the one hand side, we can look today how much the biofuels, the wind and the solar energy, how they have increased annually over the last five years. And you see that was something of the order of 50 kilowatt hours per capita and year. So compared to the 21,000 that we are actually using, it's a very small fraction, it's only 0.25%. So actually during the last years, we have only been replacing 0.25% of the fossil resources by renewable resources. If we would continue by that, we would have to divide the 100% that we want to replace by this 0.25%, something of this order. That means it needs hundreds of years until we have completely replaced the fossil resources uh, or their utilization by the use of uh, renewable energies. Apparently that doesn't make sense. By then the climate would be more or less gone. Or would not, would not, it wouldn't work until then. So we have to find other sources. And of course we can look how much input, how much economic, economic input do we actually 
input to our current power plants. And of course they are replaced, they don't have an infinite lifetime. They are replaced something of the order of 50, 60 years. But actually there are major renovations in between and the so-called economic lifetime of a power plant is of the order of 35 years. Which means that after 35 years you have invested so much that you essentially have rebuilt it. Invested for renovation or reconstruction of or exchange of certain uh, major comp uh, components in the power plant. That means that actually every year you are replacing of the order of 3% of the fossil power plants by new parts or even new power plants. So that is available currently, so to speak, as economic input to our power system. Uh, and then you see that actually you can add these two, two years and you wind up with 3.25%. Actually, you will do even a little bit better because you are, you are driving your cars not for 35 years, possibly only 10 years or so. So on the private economy, you are even a little bit faster, so there is a certain larger input actually. So something of the order of 3.25% is our current effort that we put into our energy system as a lower limit, so to speak, a lower value. So that's something we can achieve in, prin in principle. I call that the maximum growth rate because that is actually the limiting factor in the previous diagram. If I step back one slide, we saw it's increasing 20% per year. So the increase of that line is 20% per year. So that's in the logarithmic scale, it's a linear straight line. But that has to be limit, limited by the fact that actually we can only replace 3 point something percent of the overall fossil resources by the renewables per year. And so now this has to be related also to the black curve, yeah, to the change of the black curve. And that limits, that creates a certain limiting factor again. We will see how that will work out in just a moment. First of all, I would like to look at another aspect that we need to set up the full scenario. And that is actually that we want to look at what we are using the energy for. This is the energy profile. As an example, I took the data from Austria from 2009 to get some idea. Other industrial nations will have similar relations, so to speak. And we see that we have a certain number, of, a certain amount, 34.7% for transport, um, 30% roughly for room heating and air conditioning. Then we have some industrial things, uh, stationary motors, industrial furnaces, gen steam generation, illumination and computers. And now we can ask ourselves, which fractions of this energy can we replace by renewables quite easily? And we see, well, we can have electric cars, we can have uh, hydrogen driven cars, the room heating we can do with solar energy and air conditioning as well, stationary motors we can also replace by um, um, electric electrically driven uh, motors, um, steam can also pre be produced and of course illumination computers ele is electricity anyway. So we can replace almost everything but there are two factors at least where we may have problems. On the one hand side it's the tram spot until now, we do not know how to fly planes based on sustainable energies. We simply don't know. So for that, we still need a certain fraction of liquid fuels. Also for uh, trucks, there are ideas how to replace the ordinary diesel engines by a renewable, uh, motors driven by renewable energy, but that may be a little bit difficult. So also there, we may need a certain fraction of uh, liquid fuels that we have to produce. For the industrial furnaces on the other hand side, many of them just need the heat. They see need to supply the heat, the furnaces. For those we can replace it by other energies, but there are some that really require, in the chemical industry for example, they need the really the burning of a fuel in order to be able to create a certain chemi chemical atmosphere, the so-called so reducing atmosphere in the furnace to perform the corresponding chemical reactions. So that's actually required. So there also is some fuel needed that needs to be burned. Liquid fuel or could also be solid fuel for the industrial furnaces. So wood for example. Um, and what I assumed in my scenarios is now that of the entire energy we need 
10% to be supplied by biofuels for planes, some trucks and some of the industrial furnaces. Of course, one can do different assumptions here and we will directly see later what the influence is. So if you think, it, think it's only 5%, it will be easily realized uh, what that actually means because this has actually always been specified explicitly. So if that bar is only half that size, you can directly see what in, that influence will be. And now with that, we would like to do a prediction, a scenario simulation for the future. And if we do that, we get this diagram and the, it was done such that we achieve the 1.5 degree centigrade uh, as a stabilizing factor uh, when we have replaced the fossils by the renewable energies. In order to achieve that, we have to replace 3.8% of our current total energy consumption by renewables every year as a maximum limit. So in the maximum years, we have to replace almost 4% of our currently fossil-driven engines or power plants by those driven by renewable energies. If we do that, achieve that goal, that's the limit, so to speak, for achieving the goal, we see that we can replace the fossils by solar wind and biofuels and hydro energy by the year a little later than 2050. We achieve that goal and we have to do everything by 2050. So there is a little bit more time than estimated before. Before we saw it should be finished by 2000 or we should get going by 2040. Actually, if you want to achieve that goal, we have to be done a little uh, after 2050. It's still in the perspective of our, of our own lifetimes, I guess. Yeah? So it means we have to do that. It's not some later generation. It's us who has to do that. On the other hand side, we can manage and the 3.8% is not so high that it is completely unrealistic. It only means that we have to put all our efforts that we use today to rebuild and renew our fossil power plants, fossil cars and everything. We have to put that energy, so to speak, that money into building up a sustainable energy supply on all these different levels. To show how that influence actually uh, influences the individual growth rates, I show here again this logarithmic plot. We see again this 20% increase here for the solar wind, uh, solar and wind, and this is separately for the biofuels, but this is for solar and wind. And that has now been limited so that overall the replacement of the fossil resources by renewable resources is limited to this 3.8%, and that means it levels off at a certain point. So we can manage to keep on going by 20% relative to the previous year for the solar wind and also for the biofuels without problem for the next 10 years. This is up, roughly up to here. And then we will hit the limit. Then we can only manage after that only a replacement of no more than roughly 4% of the fossil resources by renewable resources because that's the limit of our economy. It doesn't say that this is the limit of the economy actually, but that is required if you want to achieve this goal. And then we can ask ourselves, is that manageable by our economy or not? And now what you can do, you can ask for the 1.5 degrees or you can ask for the 2 degrees and can ask yourself, well, what is that limiting factor? If that is slower, smaller, of course, it deviates before that. Um, and uh, also you have to take into account, of course, the world population because these are the per capita consumptions and of course you have to take into account that the overall consumption will be significantly larger if we live according to the high population variant as compared to the medium population variant that I have shown before. So this value has now been calculated by fitting the corresponding factor here, this 3.8% to the uh, all the data, so to speak, so that we achieve the 1.5 degree centigrade for the low, the medium and the high world population variant. And if we want to reach the plus 2 degree centigrade goal for the low, medium and high variant. And we directly see that the pl uh, plus 2 degree centigrade goal is much easier to achieve. It's only half the effort, so to speak, as compared to 1.5 degree centigrade. So if we want to achieve that 1.5 degree centigrade goal, we have to double our efforts.
Yeah, we saw that this is at the limit of economic feasibility. That may be quite well economically feasible. Also, we see that the world population has a strong influence. From here to here, there is again a 40 or so percent decrease with respect to the corresponding values. Yeah, 2% to 1.5% increase per year, replacement of the fossils by renewables. That's a quite significant increase yeah, from here to there. So, the more people we are, the more difficult it's, it gets. These are these numbers. At the same time, we have to realize if we want to achieve the 1.5 degrees goals, we have to be done roughly by the year 2055, which is we have roughly 40 years time. If we want to reach only the plus 2 degrees centigrade goal, we have to take a little bit more time. It can take until the year 2090, which is roughly 75 years. But it means actually that we have to keep up the numbers and if we want to stick with this goal, so to speak, we have to keep up this high number for 40 years if we want to be successful. 40 years. 40 years or more or less without economic crisis. And if there is an economic crisis where we cannot manage to keep that value that high, we have to make up in the following years. So, it's quite a strong uh, effort that we really have to take. And we have to take it globally, that's everywhere. And we should remember that today for the solar, wind and biofuel replacement, we are of the order of 0.25% annually, which means that actually uh, we have to increase our efforts by something of the order of a factor of 10. So, we have to become by a factor of 10 more um, take 10 times more effort to replace the fossil resources by renewable resources. Okay, to show again the time scale, let me show this on this diagram. This is the annual increase of the renewables relative to the total primary energy consumption. So how much of the fossil resources do we have to replace by renewable resources per year? Currently we are somewhere on this order of less than 1%. Yeah, as I said, 0.25% during the last years. And there we see we have to go to roughly 4% if we want to reach the 1.5 degrees, uh, degrees centigrade goal with the high population scenario. Or for the plus 2 degrees centigrade scenario, we have to go to roughly the plus 2%. There's a bump in here that's because of the hydro energy that's reaching its limits, so to speak. And because of that, there's a kink in this curve. But that's only a certain fraction here, so that doesn't change the major uh, outcome. On the other hand side, if we want to stick not with the high population scenario, but with the small, a medium population scenario, we see our effort is significantly reduced. The time scale is more or less the same, but the level is significantly reduced. Instead of 2%, we need only 1.6% or something like that. I don't know the numbers from the slide before. So that has to be or can be decreased significantly, which means, of course, Decreasing our population growth is quite positive for the efforts that we have to take for the future. And we also see that actually if you look at the for the next five to ten years, we can see that that increases quite strongly for the next years at the 20% rate per year, 20% annual decrease increase until we reach this upper limit, which limits our economic feasibility, so to speak, to that certain limit. Okay, so we get an idea of how much effort we actually need to take to cope with the, or to, to limit the climate change. Uh, in order to possibly make it clear how big the effort actually really is, I also plotted now the entire total primary energy consumption. That is not per capita, but for the globally added up, so to speak, in 1,000 terawatt hours per year. I can't imagine what that number actually means. It's a huge energetic um, dimension, so to speak. That's where we are today. And I plotted that for the high, the medium and the low population variant. And there we indeed see uh, how big the different act difference actually is for the different scenarios corresponding, of course, on the one hand side to the per capita growth for the next uh, decades, as well as the population growth corresponding to the different population scenarios. And there we really see that as compared to today, by the year 2060 or so, we have doubled our 
total energy consumption if we are living according to the high uh, population scenario and tripled it by the year 2100. So we have to supply three times more energy by the year 2100 if we follow that path. If we follow the medium path, it's only a factor of two roughly until the year, year 2100, significantly less. So all the efforts are significantly less and there you see directly why that influence of the population growth is so high on the effort that we have to take. Yeah, because it's significantly less and for the low population variant it's even less. Now the question is of course how does it look with the look out with the uh, look like with the temperature. So I plotted also there. This is the slide that I have shown in the beginning already. Now I added the two typical curves for the plus 1.5 degree scenario and one for the plus 2 degree centigrade scenario. And you see actually that we have to take action within the next 10 years and there we really have to see certain things. Yeah, the slope of that curve changes within the next five years or so. So we have to start today. Not only in five or ten years, no, we have to do it today. At the 20% rate per year today and then limit it later to the replacement, the overall replacement of something of the order of 2 or 4 percent, depending on the scenario we want to achieve. And you see I'm really using a sort of simple climate model so that overshoots and then it comes back again because of the interactions between the atmosphere and um, the oceans and the environment. Okay, so we can manage. But now we saw that we also need to supply other things actually. We saw that we need to supply materials as well as food at the same time and also we need to supply that on the same land or on the land area. So we should somehow regard possibly also the land area that we want to use. Well, how can we account for that? In order to get some scenario calculation for that we have to assume something about the future development of the food production and or food supply. And so I estimated some conservative, so very careful, estimate for the future. These are the past data in food production in kilocalories per capita and day. So how much food is being uh, supplied to the people. It's really the supply to the people as a function of time. This is the past. Right now we are somewhere on the order of 2,800 kilocalories per capita and year uh, and, and day, which means, of course, in the developed countries everybody has enough to eat. On the lower end of the developing countries, of course, there is still starvation. Um, so there is apparently a big issue of how to distribute that. On the other hand side, we know from the statistic that that is well enough for everybody in principle. So if we would distribute that better between the different countries, between different regions of the earth and between different people, it would be sufficient. So what I assume is that that is still increasing a little bit to cope with the problems. But I assume that until the year 2100 possibly we are better off with distributing that more evenly so that everybody gets enough supply. So you could in principle of course say, oh, okay, it's increasing like that, but I made a careful estimate. I said, oh, let's assume it's only decreasing, like, increasing like that. And so it's a lower estimate, so to speak. A lower estimate that supplies sufficient food for the people if I assume at the same time that is the distribution of the food between regions is improving. And now based on that we can look into the future with the land area productivity, extrapolating that into the future. It's also increasing a little bit every year, so we also account for that. And then we can look how does our land area utilization change into the future. And that's actually shown on this diagram. We see the land area use in million square kilometers as a function of time and we see in the past the arable land, the pastures and meadows, so where the animals are uh, living so to speak and we see the forests. All of this is more or less that land area that is in principle feasible for food, materials, energy production. Of course, in principle, we would like to keep the forests because they are important for our, e for our ecosystem. But here, between arable land and pastures and meadows, we may switch to a certain extent back and forth. And now we can look actually into the future. If we assume the productivity increase, if we assume 
the world population growth according to the high population variant and the calorie development as shown in the slide before, we see that the vegetal productivity and the feed production increases or will develop like this in this dark red color. On the other hand side, for the plus 1.5 degrees centigrade, we need, know that we need to replace fossil resources by bio-based resources, energies, by the year, year roughly 2050. And by then we of course also have to supply the corresponding biofuels, as I explained before for the data that amount where we really need some liquid or solid fuels for our processes and the 10% of our total energy consumption correspond to this uh, bar, so to speak here, or this region. And this is supplying only 10% of our total energy supply. As I said, if you assume it's only 5%, the, this is only half that high, so to speak, but nevertheless you realize it's a significant contribution, significant compared to what we need for food and feed. We did also some estimations, we published on that for the biomaterials. One can show that it's something of the order of say 300 to 600 square meters per capita that we need to produce all the plastics and all the other material for our more or less everyday living. And we need that, we can't do without that. We have to build houses and even if we don't use uh, concrete or steel, there will always be a certain uh, consumption of plastics to that. And an actual plastic is not that bad at all. It's cheaper and produces less CO2 as, for example, CO uh, concrete production. And then we can assume something about how the land area that we need to uh, grow our feed, uh, our, our animals on for, all the, for our food production. Mm, and what I did there, I compared different countries and looked what is the minimum amount of land area that is supplied to the animals, so to speak, per kilocalorie of animal food production. And if you extrapolate that, so to speak, on the global scale, that means that you need a minimum amount of pasture in order to supply your animals with the corresponding land area. Of course, you, you, you can do all that in stables and only feed them, but that's more or less what is agreed upon uh, between nations, so to speak, which is a some lower reasonable limit of land area that is required for that. And we see if we continue as we did in the past, so to speak, and we, if we replace the fossil resources by bio-based resources, energies especially, then we see that our land area that we need is increasing and by the year roughly 2060 we are hitting the line where our currently available agricultural land area is not sufficient anymore to supply all that. Then we have to cut down forests. So if we want to achieve this goal with this high population variant, we have to cut into the forest by the year 2060. No way around that. Well, you can shift a little bit the numbers, you can use a little bit of biofuels, but what you, what you realize in the end actually is that due to the population growth, this will always be an exponentially growing curve. Which means, because in the high variant the population is continually increasing, and, that's, and that means you can delay it a little bit if you play with the parameters, if you believe slightly different parameters, but it will always hit that limit. You can't avoid that. Possibly 10 years later, but that's something of the order of the changes you can expect. Now the question is, how can we influence that? Well, what happens if we don't ask for 1.5 degrees centigrade, but for 2 degrees centigrade? Now watch this, this, these curves over here. Yeah, this is now 2 degrees, nothing changed here. It only takes a little longer until the fossil resources have to be replaced by the uh, bio-based resources for the biomaterials as well as for the biofuels. And because of that only increases a little bit slower, more slowly, it will only hit that limit now instead of 2060 by the year 2075. But in the end it will also hit the limit where we have to cut into the forest and we have to cut into the, the forest quite significantly. That's quite high rate actually. That's not nice. Okay, so that parameter doesn't change too much, it only shifts it by a little bit, uh, by 10 or 15 years. Let's look what happens if we go to the medium population variant. Oh, there everything, nothing changed, only, the, well, even again the 1.5 degrees centigrade and the medium population variant. Now we can do with the agricultural land that we have available today. So we don't have to cut into the forest if we live according to the medium population variant. There we can manage everything on the currently available ag agricultural land area. So we can even achieve that. Are there more parameters that we can influence? 
Well, before I ask, uh, answer that question, let's compare that. If I go back one slide, high population variant and medium population variant, it's obvious that if we live according to the high population variant, we can possibly cope with the climate change, but people will be starving starting somewhere around 2060, or we have to cut into the forest, which means again that we have to uh, cope with the climate problems induced by that. Yeah, because the forest is of course a very uh, important parameter in our climate game, so to speak, that goes on our climate system in the world. That means, as a consequence, that actually statements that have been done in the past by quite famous people simply are not correct. Yeah, Pope Francis, in his uh, writing in the Laudato Si, he wrote in, at one point, it must be nonetheless be recognized that demographic growth is fully compatible with an integral and shared development. To blame population growth instead of extreme and selective consumerism on the part of some is one way of refusing to face the issues. Well, what I plot in red is not correct. Demographic growth simply doesn't go along with continually sustainable development because the land area will not be enough to supply enough food for everybody on the intermediate time scale. It's, so this statement is not correct. And then, of course, it's nice to blame everything on the people who have selective uh, extreme and selective consumerism, only some, of course, and to blame it on them. I think that is not really realistic, because if you look at the values that I have specified on the global average, the energy consumption and the food supply, these are not extreme values. I just assumed some average values that are realistic today. And these average val values, they are not extreme at all, and even though even though I took these more or less average values, it didn't work out. So it's not the demographic growth, it's, it, it, it is the demographic growth that kills the problem, so to speak, and it's not the selective consumerism on the part of some. But that is actually only, only a side note, so to speak. But that means actually that these balances and this scenario analysis lets you look on some political and uh, religious statements in a little different perspectives, so to speak, and to put everything in a different perspective. What I wanted to look at next, I mentioned that already, is if there are other options that we may have in order to improve the situation, to decrease the effort that we have to take in order to live with uh, climate change on the one hand side, where we saw we can manage, but that we can live also with the food production on the available land area. And this I show here now, this is the land area that we use again for the plus point 1.5 degrees centigrade, medium population, but now I switched to vegetal uh, food. That is, I reduced all the land area that I need for animal calories production. I don't need feed, I don't need land area for the animals, and that reduces the amount of land area that I need quite significantly, and there you will see that the situation is even getting significantly better. So we need even less land area if we shift towards um, plant-based food uh, and don't eat so much animal products. That doesn't mean that we have to replace that completely, but we can develop in that direction and that will decrease the pressure that we have on our land area. So this now completes more or less the scenarios that I want to present. Now I want to come to some conclusions. And so the question is, if we want to conclude something, what is the interplay between the different major drivers in the system? And for that I made a simplistic sketch, so to speak. In the center is the individual and we have our free choices. Well, our free choices, of course, on the one hand side, they determine the goods that we need, our needs and desires, and that determines the goods that we consume. It goes both ways. We have our needs and desires and the goods are coming to us and they are of course produced by somebody that is the industry and the producers who produce the goods. So they supply that and of course at the same time they produce some waste which is shown here and they use the resources that are globally available. So it goes in that direction. The resources are used to produce the goods which we demand that we get in the end and the waste is being produced here. Of course, we individually also produce some waste and the waste is then delivered into the, back into the environment. Okay, so we have sort of a cycle over here and we have to realize the driver behind that 
The only driver is the individual. All this is not driving. Yeah, the industry is not driving. Of course, they can advertise a little better, yeah, but actually the driver is us. If we buy something, we drive industry to produce that. It's not the industry. So blaming in just industry is only part of the story. It's us who determine, so to speak, our needs and desires, and that determines what industry is actually producing. At the same time, we are related to, in another direction, on this, with society, humanity, and with respect to that, especially with the values. The values determine, to a certain extent, our choices, our desires that we have, the, the, the values. And of course, it is again back and forth, this connection. We are part of society. We also, as an individual, being part of the society, influence, of course, the values that are generated or that are agreed upon. On the other hand side, the values, of course, are reflected by us and determine our behavior with respect to our desires, our free choices in the end. And then we have to realize, on the other hand side, that the society um, elects in democ democracies at least, the politicians that, so to speak, cast the values into laws and regulations. So it's us who de define the values that are then cast in laws and regulations. It's not the politicians that actually make the laws, yeah, the good politicians. That's not the case. Yeah? It's us who develop the values and then the, the elected politicians who do the laws and the regulations. Why is that so, at least in democracies? Well, if the politicians don't act according to the values everybody has agreed upon, they won't be re-elected. And that is that those possibly good laws and regulations are not realized. So only those laws and regulations are realized that conform to our values. So one has to very clearly see it's us in the end who influence the society who elect the politicians. It's again us in the center who are the drivers, so to speak. We are in the driver's seat of also that Development also is respect to the laws and regulations, and they are based, as I said, on the values. Keeping that in mind, of course, we can now influence certain things. We can influence or try to influence how the values, values are developing, and we can directly influence our individual free choices. That means our needs and desires. Based on that, I would like to come to some conclusions, sum up the results on the first slide. We have seen that there are two challenges. On the one we have this interaction between climate and energy carriers that we are using, fossil or renewables. We have seen that and we realize we can cope with that. The second problem we saw that may arise or the challenge is the land area that is used for food, bioenergy and biomaterials production. There is also a conflict, so to speak, going on or that may occur in some few decades. We have seen some major drivers behind that. One that is quite important is the population growth. That determines everything in the end if we don't take care of that. On the other hand side, we have seen that the vegetal food versus animal-based food uh, also has a certain influence on the pressure that we generate on the land area from which we produce uh, the food and other things. If we want to shift to sustainable world processes, what is actually needed? We need to shift, of course, the energy industry completely. No fossil resources anymore, only renewables. Also for the agriculture, more biomaterials, more biofuel, possibly no animals or less animals. That means it's a major shift in that major industry as well. And finally, also in the chemical industry, if you want to shift from fossil resource feedstock to bio-based feedstock. That means all the chemical industry, at least the first chemistry steps, have to completely change. Which means we are asking not only a major shift in energy industry, but in all of these three industries. Which is, of course, a quite significant economic effort for the entire society. If we want to achieve the goals with respect to climate, we have to limit the, uh, or we have to replace 5% of the, 4% uh, of the fossil resources annually until the year 2055, if you want to reach the 1.5 degree centigrade goal. And we have to replace 2% of the fossil energies until the year 2090. So for the end all of the time, throughout the 
un really all of the years until 2090 if we want to reach the plus 2 degrees centigrade goal, which are significant things, especially if we keep in mind that today we are actually only replacing 0.25% per year. So we have to increase our efforts something of the order of 10% or even significantly more if you want to reach the 1.5 degree centigrade goal. So this is a really, really big issue that we have at hand currently and that we have to solve. Lots of money that we have to take in our hands and to do it, achieve that. Now the question is of course what does that mean for us and what matters? Uh, that relates back to this uh, plot I made with the different interrelations and we have to see that there are individual choices that determine our future. It's us who are important, not somebody else, not the politicians, not the industry. It's us. It's our individual choices. Limiting the number of children. Now this looks, uh, sounds a little bit strange or trivial on, the one hand, trivial on the one hand side, a little bit extreme on the other hand side. But we have to be aware that if we take into account that for uh, roughly two children per couple on the long term we have constant population, so no population growth anymore. If everybody would have off the order of two children, a little bit more, then of course it means every third child that is born means that the first two children don't have sufficient food, energy to survive sustainably. Yeah? And it's not just at any time later, it's really in these children's lifetime that the things are important. Yeah, so we have to simply keep in mind that the population grows is nothing that simply happens. It's us who decides how many children we want to have and we have to keep in mind that the third and further children may be uh, too much for sustainable uh, development on the global scale. Another choice that I mentioned was the, to prefer plant-based versus animal-based nutrition. There's a trend, at least in some European countries today, to achieve that already. I'm vegan myself, and, but uh, I mean, everybody, until now that is still on your own, your own decision, how you want to, what you want to eat, also how many children you want to have. It's your individual choice, so I don't dare to uh, limit you in that respect, but nevertheless you should be aware that that has an influence. Then we saw that the interaction of the individual is is individuals is important, support politics for sustainability, even if the individual benefits are limited, because otherwise we will only elect those people who are good for our benefit, but not for the global sustainability. And it is important that society develops values for sustainability. We don't have that today. Today, if you, well, if you want to uh, do something special for your wife, you book a weekend trip to Madrid or to Rome or so, and of course that is not very eco-friendly, that's not very sustainable. So our values are sort of mixed up. That also relates to the values with respect to children as well as to, to nutrition. And one very major question actually is, how do the human rights relate to the individual obligations, because that is not linked today. In every national law that is sort of linked, if on the, on the road I have the right of way, that means I have the right, but the other one has to stop, that's an obligation for the other person, and vice versa, of course. For the human rights, it's not such. If I have as many children as I like, nobody cares. Yeah? Nobody can do anything to me, it's, it's simply my right. I can eat what I uh, like, but we don't relate that to the individual obligations. So on the level of human rights, that link is not being made and actually we need that if you want to realize certain um, interrelations properly that I have worked out. In general, or well, we can also make some general statements, one should strongly support the energy change from fossil so uh, resources towards change from away from source fossil resources towards development, towards sustainable resources. And of course, energy saving is also a big issue related to that. People show that quite some 10% of energy can be saved without too much problem today. Bioenergy, we saw that this large contribution of 10% on the long term may be a little bit too much, so it can only be some intermediate resource, but has to be possibly we have to shift away from bioenergy in the farther future. So it's some bioenergy is an intermediate and quick solution, easy, technology is available but on the long term that may not be so. And then one very important thing, 
everything happens within our own lifetime and that of our children. It's not somewhere in the far future. It's the ne next five to ten years that we really have to get going with 20% increase annual of the solar, wind and bioenergy. And on the other hand side we have to uh, in put 3%, 3 plus, plus percent possibly of our uh, energy uh, cost, so to speak, into that shift towards uh, renewable energies, which is a quite significant amount of money. With that, let me summarize what I've presented to you. I've shown that it's possible to reach the climate goals in principle. I've shown that sufficient food supply may be critical at some later time, some few decades later possibly. I have shown and evaluated quantitatively, quantitatively the quality global efforts that are required to achieve the climate goals especially. And I have shown and hopefully made clear that the change in individual choices of each of us is essential and that everything has to happen in our lifetime and that of our children. That is, again, as a last statement, it's us who decide. With that, I ho hope I have given you some insight into the major parameters, the major drivers, and well, possibly I didn't convince you directly, but perhaps give, have given you some background for the discussion of these uh, topics and these issues, and I hope that you will be benefiting from that, and I hope, of course, that we will indeed make it. Thank you very much. <laughs>